prophet we're talking about on Sunday, we're going to talk a little bit about on Wednesday of that week. So um, basically on Sunday, we did sort of an overview of the three chapters in the book of Joel. But tonight, I wanted to really focus for a few minutes on chapter 2, verses 12 through 32. And in 12, it begins with these words, yet even now, which is really huge. And so we're going to talk about that in a moment. But let me be sure I don't forget to do this. Tonight, as you are here, uh, the growth group sign-ups are on the window out here at the library uh, area. So tonight, as you're here, as you're leaving, if you might want to take a few moments, go by there, sign up for a growth group. Uh, I will share with you there are uh, a little bit of a few changes that are happening this semester. Some of the houses that we're hosting in the spring are still going to be hosting. Some are not. Uh, for instance, uh, I've hosted in our house for a couple of times, and, and I wanted to, to come back to the church group for this fall semester, so I'll be leading the church group, one, one, of, the, one of the church groups. That clues you in that there's a second church group. And I'll be leading one of the church groups at 5 o'clock on Sundays. Brother Corey and Amy are going to have their group here in the choir room at 5 o'clock on Sundays. And then there'll be a college and career uh, growth group that will be at 6.30 on Sunday. So a lot of things happening on Sunday night. So the plan is that Corey and Amy uh, will be leading that group. Mark will be leading the youth here. I'll be leading a group here. And then at 6.30, we're going to kick all of you out, and then we're going to have the college and career. So I'm just kidding. But that, so it's going to be a, a lot of things that are going on. And so, but also additionally, uh, what we're wanting to do on Wednesday nights is we are, as you've heard a little bit, we're going to have six o'clock uh, Bible study in here, six o'clock choir rehearsal in there. We're also going to continue whenever that makes or however that makes this gun class. And I joke about that, y'all, because we were going to do a one and done gun class and it's never missed a semester. So I don't know. We've trained everybody in North Baldwin County. It's been funny. But, but at any rate, uh, so it's just a perpetual thing. And I was like, okay, just put it on the calendar and be done with it. But, but at any rate, um, so that will be happening. But also, Carolyn and Dwayne Dean are going to be leading a Wednesday night growth group option. So here's what I need you to help me spread this word. So what if somebody says, well, you know, I'd love to do the growth group, but, you know, Sunday nights and, you know, of course, the church groups here, we have child care provided if we know, and that's why there's sign up there. But what if you can't make it on Sunday night? But what about Wednesday night? You know, it's like, I, I want to do it, but I, what about Wednesday night? Well, Wednesday night, if you, particularly if you have children, that's a built-in thing. Because if you have a teenager, they're with the youth. If you have a child, first through six, they're with Miss Megan. If you have mission friend age, they're in mission friends. And so it's already built in. So six o'clock on Wednesday is another growth group option. And so I want to share with you that I'm really excited about what our topic is this fall. It's Crisis 101. Um, how, make me sure how, how something about, let me get my wording right. Uh, making sense of life when life doesn't make sense. Okay. And Robert Morgan wrote this book entitled The Red Sea Rules. Has anybody read that book anywhere? No? Okay, great. Well, I'm going to get you a copy. And so uh, the growth group will have a manual with that and a Red Sea Rule. So let me tell you a little bit about Robert Morgan's story. Y'all are getting a lot of extra tonight, okay? So Robert Morgan was on a plane ride home, and so a lot of things were not going well in his life. And he'll talk about some of those. Some of those were his wife's health issues that she was experiencing. And his daily Bible reading was Exodus 14. Well, Exodus 14 is where the children of Israel are backed up against the Red Sea and against Pharaoh's army. And he was just reading Exodus 14 on a plane ride from somewhere in Europe back to the States. And God showed him 10 principles to how you're going to get through this. 10 principles. And God just laid it on his heart. Thing number, principle number one, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. God knows where you are. 
where you are. You see, because in, in, in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, God told Moses and the children of Israel to go to this particular place. And there they stood with their backs against the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army was coming. So God knew where they were. He told them to be there. And God could have done a lot of different things. God could have, he had blocked all these things, and he'd done all these things, and God could have, you know, swooped down and just smote the Egyptian army. God could have done a, a many, many different things. But God, the principle number one is God knows where you are, even when you're in a crisis. Doesn't always mean God put you there. Sometimes we did that to ourselves. But God knows where you are. And he knows what you're going through. So it's these kinds of things that are going to walk us through in these 10 principles of the fall semester. So share this with people. Share these options with people. Uh, what we're trying to do is equipping and discipling on Wednesday nights. I'm going to be in here. We're going to have our Bible study. We're going to have our prayer time. Choir's going to be going on. These sessions in here will be videotaped, and Brother Ben will upload those on a Thursday. So if you're in choir at 6 o'clock and you're like, I missed what, what, what he was talking about with Obadiah or whatever, don't run home and go watch it on Wednesday night because it's not going to be ready yet. But it will be uploaded on Thursday. So, so if you're in another group, you can still catch what's happening in here because in here was the easy thing to do to set up a camera and listen to me ramble. All right. Here, so, speaking of which, in Joel chapter 2, let's look in verse 12. Yet even now declares the Lord. I love that. I can't get over that. Because if you really to, to look at that and see what the first 11 verses are, Joel is talking about a coming judgment on the land and on the people because of their rebellion. And so he starts calling out all of their sin and all of their wrongdoing and all of the things that they've done wrong. And because of this, God is going to bring judgment. And so, yet, even now. In verse, chapter 2, verse 11, the verse immediately preceding that, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now. So this is talking about what Brother Corey was leading us to sing about a few moments ago. Just the greatness of God. And how God really opens up a door of grace in our lives and an area of repentance. So I'm just going to share with you three things. God's call for repentance. God responds to his people when they repent. And God promises his spirit to us when we're in a relationship with him. That's Joel chapter 2. In the New Testament, Paul writes, <clears throat> We shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. In Romans chapter 14, in verse 10, everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. We'll all stand there. The New Testament <clears throat> proclaims that the day of the Lord is coming, the day when Christ will return to set up the kingdom of God, and there will be a coming final judgment over all who inherit eternal life and the kingdom, and then those who will not inherit the eternal life in the kingdom. And so that's that final day of judgment. And so the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, it alludes to it. It sees it as this distant, distant future that's happening. At some point in time, there's going to be this ultimate day of the Lord. And remember, I might have shared some of that Sunday. There was that, 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 that imminent day of the Lord. That's that immediate day of the Lord. But then there's that ultimate day of the Lord, which Joel chapter 3 speaks of. And that day is coming. And so when it comes, that's where the Christ will return to set up that kingdom. But now Jesus teaches us in his teachings, no one knows when that hour will be. Remember that? Because they asked Jesus, they said, hey, when will these things happen? 
And Jesus said, I'm telling you, no one knows. And Jesus, I'm quoting from Scripture, Jesus said, no, not even the angels know, nor do I, but only the Father knows, and He hasn't disclosed it yet. So Jesus didn't know. And Jesus didn't know when the Father was going to tell Him it's time. And that's why Jesus would tell us in passages such as Matthew 25, watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. For you never know when the trumpet of the Lord will sound. Uh, don't you love that song? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the glory of the Lord is bright and fair. Yeah, yeah, that's a great song. You don't know. And so Jesus was telling us in Matthew 25, watch and be ready. Be ever ready. Live your life purposefully. Because you don't know. Joel chapter 2, 11 says, The day of the Lord is fearful and awesome, is another word for it, but another word for that is terrible. Who can endure it? And so Joel is painting a picture of an imminent coming of the day of the Lord because the people wouldn't turn their hearts back to God. And he's saying, listen, if you don't, God's going to use another attention-getting moment in your life, and he's going to allow another army to come in and invade and sweep you away to teach you a lesson again. But then right after that, he comes back to 2.12, and he says, yet even now, right now, d despite all the failings that we've had, despite where we've messed up, despite the sin in our life and our rebellious nature, God is willing to forgive, yet even now. And yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to me with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of his bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep be between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, Where is their God? In this fearful and terrible climate of Joel's message of judgment upon his readers, God puts on Joel's heart to tell them Yet, even now, is a time of repentance. God is saying, this is what I'm going to do. It's not what I desire to do. I desire for my people to repent. I desire for my people to get their lives back in order in me. And it's the same message applying to that coming judgment of Joel's audience. It's the same message to us. It's the same message to our neighbors on our street and in our city and in our county. It's the same message beyond that to our nations around the world that still yet even now. So listen, yet even now, in the 21st century of America in the years to come. Even now, amid our violent, unjust, unbelieving, and indifferent society, if the people would repent. Even now, 
if we would drop all of our violence, our unjustness, our unbelieving, and our indifference in our world. Even now, if our situation is marked with disdain for our neighbor's needs, we neglect the will of God in our lives. We're now amid of our fears, of our sufferings, of our guilt, of our ignorance of God's grace. Uh, the God of all mercy holds out to us the opportunity for repentance and to return that we would know salvation and the day of the Lord. Even now, even now, the addict can be saved. Even now, even now, the most vile among us of which we all are in some way can return to the Lord. Even now, there's never too far to go that God can't reach you. And that's the message of Joel in the second chapter. It's a call to repentance, a call to come back to the Lord. And he's talking about, and I spent a little time on this Sunday, rent your heart, not your garments. And that is, it's an internal decision that produces a real change rather than an outward display. We're going to see this, and not this week, but the next week. Well, no, no, sorry. This week is Amos. I get, I've been so far in advance of this, I get my weeks messed up. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Jonah, when he didn't want to go to, you know, Jonah, Dr. Cox, would you agree that Jonah was the most, I mean, he just mumbled a message. I mean, you know, Jonah did not want these Assyrians saved. He wanted them smoted. He didn't like them. They didn't like them in the first place. They weren't his people. And God said, go talk to these people that you don't like and tell them to be saved. And he says, I'm not going to do it. And so he does a 180. God told him to go to Assyria, and he went completely in the opposite direction and got on a ship. And he said, I didn't go far enough. I'm at the port. I'm getting on a ship, and I'm leaving. And so God gets there, and I can only imagine Jonah's probably walking through the street, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, hey, I don't even want you to be saved. I want you to die. And people were like, what? Because Jonah had the power of God and he was preaching a message possibly, probably, I won't say possibly, half-heartedly, but people, it says in, in Jonah very clearly, they rent their garments, they sat down, they put ashes on their head, they did all these outward appearances of repentance. And so Joel was reminding the people, God is not looking at, you know, did you tear up your clothes? You remember Sunday we were talking about save the shirt. It's a nice shirt. Save the dress. Don't tear up your clothes. Change your heart. Save the shirt. Change the heart. And so that's where God was telling Joel in this point. He's saying, listen, I'm not interested in their theatrics nor their drama. I'm interested in a change of their life getting to the core of who they are, an internal decision that produces a real change in their lives and an outward display. In chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, the word heart occurs twice. It's emphasizing that inward change. Yet, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger. He abounds in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Who knows? Will he not re re return and relent and leave a blessing behind him? But it has to do with your heart, not the theatrics of a drama that didn't happen with an inward change. The word return is found in all three of those verses, and God is declaring, return to me. Now I shared, the word heart is found twice in those three verses. But it's from the heart that we have our problems. And, and you know, we... we we hear this a lot, and, and I know this is ugly, and I'm not trying to pick on people. I know what they mean. He has a good heart. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Follow your heart. 
where will that lead you? Trouble. And here's why. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, when God was about to unleash the flood, it says, the imagination and the thoughts of our hearts is what brought us into this trouble. It's the heart where our wickedness lies, our grudges, our pride, our hatred, and our selfishness. It all comes from the heart. Jesus <laughs> cleared it up. In Matthew chapter 15, and I told you the wrong scripture back there, Ben, don't, don't get excited. So uh, chapter 15, verses 17, it, Jesus says, Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach is eliminated? Because this was the problem. They were fussing at Jesus because you didn't wash your hands. I mean, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. How gross. And he's like, they're grubby guys. What can I say? I mean, that's what they do. They clean fish for a living. They don't care. We were talking about this one time, and this is going to gross y'all out. My brother-in-law and kind of and I kind of grew up together. We were talking about how we used to go catfish at night, and this was like, we called it tight line. You just tight line, put a little bell on the end. You sit in the total dark all night long, sitting there talking. And you, when your fish gets on the line, your little bell goes, and then you just grab it, you catch fish. Of course, you know, by the time you're baiting your hook and all that, handling your fish, and then you got your hands down in a Dorito bag, and, you know, you just get, because you're just, you're just being grubby. I was like, do you believe we did that? He said, yeah, you want to go tonight? I was like, no. <laughs> but, but, you know, and it just, but, you know, they were fussing about washing their hands. And Jesus is saying, listen, listen, listen to the 17th verse. Do you not understand that everything that goes in the mouth passes to the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And that defiles a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Now, we know we need to wash our hands, but Jesus is making a spiritual point. Because the, the Pharisees and Sadducees were like talking about ceremonial cleanliness and that you guys didn't wash your hands properly before you went to the temple, and that's not a good thing, and I don't see how you guys can talk about loving God because you didn't wash your hands. And Jesus is like, you can have the cleanest hands around and have the most wicked of hearts. Because it's from the heart. And so this passage is talking about that true change of heart. The prophets are calling about a repentance of the heart, a true and sincere repentance. The presumption is that the heart rending repentance that allows to a new action that the heart then will then follow into goodness of life. From the heart, when the heart is changed, then the Spirit of God comes, and then there's goodness and kindness and peace and love and justice and righteousness when the Lord is the Lord of our lives. And it's not only the prophet Joel that has talked about this. Listen to the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. It reads this, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, that I will put my law within them on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So Jeremiah is talking about a change of heart, and there's coming a day when God will work. And he didn't understand. God had not given him the full picture of, hey, in Acts chapter 2, a very, very long time ago, I mean, a long time from now, there's going to be this thing called Pentecost, and this guy named Peter, he's not even his mom and dad aren't even born yet, he's going to preach a sermon about this. He just saw a little, he couldn't see the whole picture. He could just see through a, a slit of a vision. It's like, I don't know what's coming, but God's telling me there's coming a time in the future. Ezekiel picked up. God told him about this as well. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 26 and following, this is what the scripture read. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. That's what we have is a stone heart. 
We got a hard rock stone heart without God. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land and I gave to your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanliness and I will call you in the grain and multiply it and I will not bring famine on you. I will multiply the fruit and the tree and the produce in the field so you will not receive again the disgrace of the famine among you. And so Ezekiel is talking about what's to come with a new heart. He didn't understand it. He's just saying what God told him to say. It's coming. Joel later says, I don't know. I know Jeremiah talked about it. I know Ezekiel talked about it. I don't really know what I'm talking about, people. But God's telling me, save the shirt. Change your heart. Something's coming. And we know that that was coming. And as we see in Joel chapter 2, we see where that was coming. Paul declares when the soul has repented. You might want to jot this down. I love this passage. Romans chapter 5, 5. It says that God's love has been poured into our hearts, the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts. God did that. But it comes from that call of of repentance. When we repent, that's where God's love comes in our heart, where our hearts are changed. So God calls for repentance, the first part uh, that we're looking at in Joel chapter 2. But then also we find that God responds to his people. Judgment was turned away, as we found later in Joel. In Joel chapter 2, beginning in verses 18 through 27, it says the deliverance is promised. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land, and he will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send you grain and new wine and oil, and you, when you are satisfied and full with them, I will never again make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove that northern army far from you, and I will drive it into the parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea, and its stench will arise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. For the tree that has borne its fruit, the fig tree and the vine, have yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early early rain for your vindication. He has poured down from among you rain, and the early and the latter rain is before. The threshing floors will be full of grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. And then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who dwelt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame. And so God responds to his people. He turns away the judgments that was coming their way. And so rather than bring wrath, That whole section of scripture is that God is bringing blessing. In verse 21, that it says very clearly, Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. There's a song that our worship ministry sings. I believe they sang it last Sunday. It's entitled, Great Things. And the verse first goes like this. Come, let us worship our king. Come, let us bow at our feet. At his feet, he has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. And the chorus, O hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. O God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. O Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. O God, you have done great things. Verse 2, you've been faithful through every storm. You've been faithful evermore. You've done great things. All I know, all I know you will do again. 
for your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. You see, in chapter 2 of Joel, it tells us that. God is saying, when my people repent, I will do great things in their lives. Because that's all he wants is you. That's all he wants you. How many times we think of all these things? We're going to see this in Micah. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To love justice, to give mercy, and just to walk humbly with your God. That's all he wants you. Because, you know, from time to time, maybe we've even thought and said, God, what do you want from me anyway? And Micah says, I got your answer. To love mercy. To be just, walk justly, and to walk humbly with your God. He just wants you. That's what he wants. He wants you. Man, when we think about this passage... And I think about how God responded to his people then and how he's promising that he will respond to us. Verse 23 says, rejoice and be glad. Oh, rejoice, O sons of Zion. Be glad in the Lord your God. Verse 27, he will be with you. And I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. There is no mother and, and no other and my people will never be put to shame. And so these promises of the presence of God, the blessings of God, of the work of God in our lives. And then third and last is this section that God promises his spirit. And here he says, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. On your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, and the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, those who escape, and the Lord said, even among the survivors whom the Lord called. In Acts chapter 2, I shared this Sunday. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter was preaching this sermon to Pentecost. Now, you know, I, I just want to let you know that, that if you're uh, people who in the room that, uh, you know, are preaching, uh, Dr. Cox, certainly, our pastor emeritus, uh, Brother Keith in the back, pastor of church, but Daniel getting started preaching. You know, you didn't just walk up and just say, hey, I got a message today. Usually, you spend a little time, right? You know, yeah, how, how much time did Peter have? Zero. It was ex extemporaneous preaching. He didn't like, man, if I ever get a chance to talk to everybody at Pentecost, this is what I'm going to say. No, he didn't. He never knew, that was, no, knew it was coming. He had no clue. No clue. And the Holy Spirit came upon them in the upper room and drove them out into the street. And they began to preach and teach and prophesy. And Peter gathered everybody that would listen, and he began a sermon. And he didn't say, guys, I was up all night getting this ready. But it was totally extemporaneous, moved by the Spirit of God on the spot. And where does he go? Joel chapter 2. We don't have Peter's full sermon in Acts chapter 2. No way. No way. We have what God intended us to have excerpts from that. But Peter began, and, and, and when Luke, that was the historian writer, was putting this together, he was saying, and Peter, he quoted from Joel chapter 2, and it shall be in the last days that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves and men and women, I will in those days I will pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon will be blood, and before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Man, as I think about that. As God promises his spirit and we see that fulfillment coming at the day of Pentecost of Acts chapter 2 verses 16 through 21. That Joel 2 passage, if you will, Joel 2, 12 through 32. It just sort of hit me in the last few weeks as I was working through Joel. This is truly a picture of salvation. Now, and this is what I mean. There's a call to repentance. There's God's response. And then there's God giving the Holy Spirit. And so in Joel chapter 2, it was happening then, but it was really coming to fruition after the birth, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. But even around, and I I told you circa 500 B.C., somewhere around there is where the, the prophet Joel was speaking. But 500 years before, he was giving foreshadowing what it's going to be like to be saved. There's a call to repentance. Everybody's got to deal with that. Do you accept Jesus or not? Then if you do, then you've got to repent from your sin. And then God responds to your repentance. And then third was the blessing of God that comes into your life and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so chapter 2 from 12 through 32 lays out that, lack of a better term, process of salvation. And it wasn't even time yet. But he was laying it out for the people of that day in their time. And then as we see will come to fruition some years later in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And then You know, we spent a lot of time Sunday on Joel chapter 3, when maybe not a lot of time, but more time. Joel chapter 3 is talking about that ultimate day of the Lord, that day that is yet to come, that Jesus said nobody knows the hour, not his angels. I don't, only the Father knows, and he hasn't disclosed it yet. But we see those pictures as relayed in Revelation 19 and 20, what that ultimate day of the Lord will look like. And so we're between the two. We're hanging right there, just hanging on. It could happen at any time. But that's why Jesus said in Matthew 25, watch and be ready. And as we talked about Sunday, I hope, I pray that we can really help people see this message. The prophecy of Joel, the first chapter was an actual locus. The second chapter came true. The third chapter will come true as well. It's just a not yet. And so between the cha- chapter 2 and between chapter 3, when the ultimate day of the Lord comes, there is a time for salvation. Ben, can we go back to that original screen, that first one? Very first, chapter 2, verse 12. Yep, that's it right there. Yet, even now. Yet, even now. Preacher, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what happened to me. You don't know. You don't know. You're right. I don't. And not because I don't love you. Just I don't need to know. I just know. Yet, even now. No matter where you've been. What you've done. How far you've been. And how far you run, yet even now. What a message from Joel. Let's pray. Father, we love you and I thank you for this prophet that you gave your word through to your people then and now. Father, may we be carriers of the yet even now message through the rest of this week and in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name I pray.